Friends, we hear the language from both the right and the left all the time. We're told that all people are made in the image of God. Is this true? What does scripture say about the image of God and who is made in it? What has the historic church taught about the image of God? Are babies born in the image of God? Does President Biden know who's made in the image of God? How about Johann Gerhard, Martin Luther, Francis Pieper, Tertullian, the Pope, Reverend Harrison, abolitionists rising? We got a full show coming to you right now, right here on The Truth at All Costs. Adam Wright commented on X. He reposted last week's show and said, You speak worse of stone choir than of sodomites. There's no reason for anyone to look into Lutheranism. It's obviously dead. Well, putting non sequiturs aside, it's obvious that Lutheranism is far from dead. I'll address his comparison of how I speak about stone choir and the LGBTQ at the end of the show. So don't go away, my friends. You're going to want to hear that. Stick around. It'll be good. I promise. All right, well, welcome to The Truth at All Costs, friends and foe alike. I'm your host, Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, getting over a little bit of a cold, uh, so sorry about the nasaliness, if you can hear that in my voice. I am the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church out here in Ferndale, California, where, get this, my friends, get this, every single baptized member of our congregation, every single one of them, has been made in the image of God, truly. But sadly, not many of our neighbors have been. It's true. That's the sad state of affairs. On this podcast, you get straight talk about the culture from the Christian perspective. No pandering, no placating, no politically correct lies that aid in the devil's murderous ways. No, sir, we're not into any of that. We're Christians, and our aim is to be faithful to the whole counsel of God's Word, understanding the spirit of our day, and therefore, upon what battlefield we're fighting. We work toward peace, if possible, indeed, but speak the truth at all costs. We'd love to hear from you, so comment on the video if you're watching on YouTube, Spotify, or Rumble, and you can also connect with me on Instagram or X. My handle is Tyrell Bramwell, that's at T-Y-R-E-L-B-R-A-M-W-E-L-L. You can also send me an email at tyrellbramwell.com slash contact. That's T-Y-R-E-L-B-R-A-M-W-E-L-L dot com slash contact. It's just my name dot com slash contact. This encouraging email came into the inbox this week from Ryan. He writes, Pastor Bramwell, I have to sincerely thank you for your recent videos addressing members of the Stone Choir. These videos are how I found your channel, your podcast. I've been listening to the Stone Choir podcast for the last few months, and while certain topics I never got on board with them on, others had more of a ring of truth to them, but I was never really settled in my conscience whether I could continue listening to them. They especially troubled me in regards to claims they made about the Missouri Synod. I've been contemplating finishing my bachelor's and then working toward going to seminary for a few years. But their claims about the Synod unsettled me and made me question if this was a good path. But thanks be to God that you have shown me the awful anti-clericalism that thrives among this crowd. I refuse to be on Twitter or X. And so I would never have seen this had you not put it in a video. I confess I have yet to unsubscribe from their podcast, but I think I'm likely to soon. I'm afraid it will take me a a while to untangle the truth from any lies that they have mixed with it. So I hope you can continue to shine a light on some of the darkness of this crowd. (laughs) Not that I want you to become just the anti-stone choir guy. Many thanks in Christ, Ryan. Well, my friend, it is a privilege to be of service, Ryan. It really is. I give thanks to God for what he's doing in your life and for the small part he's allotted me as his servant. Thank you for your email of encouragement. I pray you will indeed, my friend, pursue the ministry. The Missouri Synod is a faithful denomination full of repentant sinners. Pastors aren't perfect, to be sure. Neither are the laymen. None of us are. But by and large, the pastors in our denomination strive to be nothing but faithful. Sounds like that's your heart too. So Christ be with you, brother. I pray you do pursue the ministry. 
All right, friends, with that awesome email behind us, such a good thing to hear. Thank you so very much again, Ryan. And it is why we address even hard topics and we deal with things in a more direct way than you might be used to in other places. Um, So yeah, thanks for that. All right. Speaking of striving toward faithfulness, we have a show today that deals with a phrase, as you heard in the intro, that we hear quite a bit. And it's used both by our allies and our opponents. It's even used by our very own. Yes, I was troubled to hear it being used recently, even by the faithful LCMS president, Reverend Matthew Harrison. Again, to reiterate what I just said to Ryan, no pastor is perfect. And that even goes, yes, for the president of our synod, for President Harrison. I don't think there's anything intentionally malicious on his part in using this phrase, but the words were said in a public ad, radio ad, for Lutheran schools on issues, etc. And so we ought not shy away from publicly addressing them. I am a big fan of issues, etc. They have been a formidable part of my life of changing who I am from bringing me out of evangelicalism into Lutheranism, even in the days before podcasting when my pastor had to burn the episodes onto a CD so I could play them in the truck out in the oil field when I was still in Wyoming before I left to pursue the ministry. So do they always get everything right? Of course not. They're human beings like everybody. But by and large, the guys over at Issues, etc. are faithful men, just as is our president. And so I say this, I bring up President Harrison's mention of this just because he mentioned it, not because there's any sort of intent to attack him or anything. No, I think he's a very faithful brother in the ministry. But from airwaves to airwaves, we should speak about this when we see it, when we hear it. And this is the kind of thing we talk about on this show. And so we're going to talk about it. We don't shy away from things. We don't pander. We don't placate. And we don't deal with politically correct lies to aid in the murderous ways of the devil. (laughs) Just not what we do here. And we're not going to start, not this early on or nor, nor ever. But he's not the only head of a church body to use this phrase recently. In the news this very week, on the same day that all the evangelicals were worried about the the eclipse showing us the end of days, which I should say, as a side, everything that does happen in the heavens is to make you think of the Lord's promise of return. Yes, when we see marvelous, glorious things happening, it does speak to the glory of God, and it speaks to our Creator existing and the promises that He has made, especially when we look up into the heavens, we straighten up and we think about our Lord's return. Was that particular sign a sign of the end? Well, no. There's all kinds of problems with that. We can deal with that in another video. But on that same day, we'll get back on the topic here. On that same day, you should be looking for Jesus all the time, my friends, <laughs> looking for his return. On that same day, finally, we're getting back to it. Pope Francis, on April 8th, issued a document, Dignitas Infinita which is all about this phrase, this phrase that humans are made in the image of God. So we're going to deal with it. Everybody's talking about it. So to start, let's hear how my brother in the ministry, President Harrison, uses the phrase. This is Pastor Matthew Harrison, president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The LCMS operates the second largest parochial school system in the United States. What can you expect from a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod School? There's one race, the human race. And Jesus died for the sins of every man, woman, and child from every land and every nation. Life begins at conception. All life is precious from womb to tomb. And every student, parent, and teacher is created in the very image of God. There's right and wrong, and we know which is which from the Ten Commandments. There are only two sexes. Male and female, he created them. Marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman. There's such a thing as objective, absolute truth, and it's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ and his word. To find a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod school near you, visit lcms.org schools. So I would say that there was a time, yes, when we could have said that everyone in our schools was made in the image of God, back when our schools were truly parochial schools, meaning when they were staffed only by Lutherans and taught only Lutheran students. 
But it's been a long time, friend, a long time since that's been the case. Today, most of our schools see themselves as mission fields, not so much to serve the children of the parish, but to serve the children of the broader community that the church and school reside in, in hopes of introducing the neighbors to Jesus. This is certainly how it was in the school that I had the honor of pastoring for a short time in Murray, Utah. Now, in this situation, as we will see with non-Lutheran staff and non-Lutheran students, we cannot rightly say that everyone in our schools is made in the image of God. That will come out once we get into the texts for today. A few more points before we get into Scripture. Our friends and our allies battling against the murder of our unborn neighbors, they use this term as the ultimate reason for the cause that they are fighting for life, don't they? Here's an example from the Abolitionist Rising group, a group that you know uh, most of you know, I think. I hope you know, I hope you watched the video from Cross Defense before we shifted to Truth at All Costs, where I interviewed T. Russell Hunter, the founder of Abolitionist Rising. I appreciate their work. I hope you know that. I appreciate these guys to no end. They're doing great work in service to our neighbors. And this is what we read from their website. The abolitionist does not think that you can write laws to protect babies because they feel pain and then write laws to protect babies because they have beating hearts, then write laws to protect babies because they are human. By writing such laws, pro-life legislators train the culture to believe that abortion is permissible up to the point of pain or the possession of a beating heart, instead of instructing the culture to abolish abortion because it is the murder of a human being created in the image of God. So, just as I appreciate Reverend Harrison, I appreciate the work T. Russell Hunter and his guys are doing, his crew, his group, his organization, and I agree completely with the idea of ending abortion immediately for all humans, despite the stage of their development. And for all the reasons, save one, that they mention in that about phrase, that statement. But do we agree with this because abortion is the murder of a human being created in the image of God? Oh, it is the murder of a human being, yes. We agree with that. It's true. It's the created in the image of God part that we're going to consider on today's show. That's the part that causes us to pause. And like the Roman Catholics are saying, Every human being should be treated with dignity, which we all would say, amen, yes. But why? Well, they say it's because every human being is made in the image of God. But no. It's because every human being has the potential to be restored to the image of God. This is why we, as Orthodox historic Christians, show dignity to our brothers. Or you might say, because every human being stands as a reminder that we as a creature, a creation, were originally created in the image of God, mankind. And so just as we treat the elements once used to bring us Christ's body and blood in communion with reverence and respect, even after the Lord's Supper is completed and finished for what once was, we value and respect all humans for what mankind once was, what we once bore, once bore, the image of God. And then we can also add, and what in Christ is restored to those who believe in Jesus. All right. It's important, my friends, that we think all of this through, because like the Roman Catholics are doing in the church realm, the progressives... The, the Democrats, in America at least, I don't know how it works out in every other Western state, Western country, the progressives are doing the same thing in the civil realm. We're getting it from both sides, both the ecclesial and the secular. It's a phrase made in the image of God. It's being used by our opponents on the LGBTQ battleground, isn't it? We hear that all the time. 
What did President Biden say when he issued his proclamation this very year on Easter that Easter was Transgender Day of Visibility? Well, he didn't say Easter was, but he said March 31st, which was Easter, was also Transgender Day of Visibility. What was his rationale and his reasoning? Well, we see on X what he tweeted to go with that announcement. He says, today on Transgender Day of Visibility, I have a simple message to all trans Americans. I see you. You are made in the image of God, and you're worthy of respect and dignity. Well, is that true? Well, if so, I guess we're kind of at a stalemate, aren't we? If we're being logically consistent, those on the side of life say it's because humans are made in the image of God. And those on the side of barrenness, on the side of child mutilation, genital mutilation, on the side of increased depression and, and increased suicide rates, in a word, those on the side of death, well, they likewise say that advocating for this death culture is because humans are made in the image of God. How can it be bold? Well, the short answer to the question is no. No, all human beings are not made in the image of God. And at first it may shock you to hear a pastor say such a thing because you're used to what the culture says and you haven't thought it all the way through. The way we use that phrase today is at worst a deceptive lie of the devil used to disarm Christians who are trying to love their trans neighbors with the truth or any other neighbor with the truth. And at best, it's a mistaken reading of several key Bible verses. And this isn't new. This stuff has been hashed out in the church centuries ago. Friends, what human beings are made in the image of God? There, there is a particular demographic of humanity that is, in fact, made in God's image. And only this particular demographic who are indeed made in the image of God. Who are they? You know the answer. Christians. Baptized believers in Jesus Christ are the only human beings who are made in the image of God. That's the truth. This is what the Bible teaches. But even before we look at the scriptures, if this is not the case, if you think this isn't true, and you're a Christian, then ask yourself, why am I a Christian? Why are you a Christian, friend, if you don't believe that to be true? What is it that you think happened to you when you became a Christian? Do you not think that you've been set apart, made anew, made holy in the blood of Christ? I'm going to assume you know what Tertullian said is true, even while I assume you never knew Tertullian said it. Christians are not born, he said, but they become Christian. And St. Augustine, he says the same thing this way. Not generation, but regeneration makes Christians. To use slightly more common language, not birth, being born physically from your mother, but rebirth makes Christians. Being born in the waters of baptism by your Father. This is what it means to be made in the image of God. It is to be a Christian. It is to be one who has been made new by the blood of Christ. It is to be one who has received the Holy Spirit and a clean conscience and a new heart and all of this that we talk about every single week. Rebirth makes a Christian. Rebirth makes you into the image of God as you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when you have faith in Christ Jesus. All right, we have two texts from the Apostle Paul that give us this wisdom that we need, the wisdom we need to counter the Roman Catholics, to counter President Biden's line of reasoning, yes, even sadly to say, to counter our Baptist friends in the same, you know, marching with us in the fight for life. Uh, we have a debate here, we, and we have two texts that will get us through this false line of reasoning. 
We'll get to what that means for our abolitionist colleagues in a little bit. But first of all, let's look at the text. Ephesians 4, verse 24, and Colossians 3, verse 10. What do they say? Well, let's start with Ephesians 4. And as we look at this, let's start at verse 17 for a little bit of context. Can't give you the whole reading of the entire book. We'll be here all day. But let's at least start at verse 17. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And now verse 24, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Does mankind prepossess the likeness of God here in this text? Before receiving the new self that Paul is talking about, it, do we prepossess it? Are we born with it? No. Without Jesus, man lives in the futility of his mind, darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God because of our ignorance. In a word, we are sinful. But hearing of Christ and being taught Christ we put off our old self and are renewed in the spirit of our minds, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Guys, what is God, <laughs> actually, by the way? Maybe we should establish this too. What is God? What is it that the Christian, that you are made into the likeness of? Probably shouldn't end a sentence with of, but you get the idea. What is it? that we are reformed or restored into? What is the new self that we put on? What is this likeness? Paul just told us. True righteousness and holiness. God is truly righteous, truly holy. The Christian is baptized into his righteousness and holiness. We put on Christ. We, we wear his righteousness, his robe of righteousness. That's that's what our podcast producers have received in Christ, assuming, assuming that all of the podcast producers are all Christians. I don't know why a, a non-Christian would support this show, but as of the recording of this episode, Ronald M.R.J. Funk, R.L., David Littman, Asa Hoffman, Seth Murray, Isaac Spangler, Philip, Brian Yamabi, and Baron Albatross, love that name, our podcast producers that support the show, and we are thankful for all their righteous and holy help, their Christian help, worked in the name of Christ for the sake of serving others, that you might learn, that others might learn what the true image of God is, and receive it and or become encouraged in the truth of what you've already received in your baptisms. The same is true for our unashamed underwriters whose names are right now on this screen, Thank you to all you guys and to our podcast partners as well for everyone who financially supports this podcast by being members of my YouTube channel. Okay, well, how was that? Was that only a slightly clunky segue? <laughs> but it is true. We are baptized into the righteousness of God, his holiness. That is the thing that defines, that, that is what defines the image of God. When we say we are made in the image of God, we're not talking about reason or intellect or, or any of that. We're talking about holiness and righteousness. So let's look at the other verse, the other one that clearly teaches who is made in the image of God. This one is Colossians 3, verse 10. Let's start at verse 1 for some context. And I'm, 
I'm sure, guys, you're going to see the similarities between these two pericopes, both written by Paul, and you're going to see how they parallel one another. Here we go. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now... You must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That's verse 10. So the faithful Johann Gerhard, he helps us understand these texts here. He helps us understand that there's not a distinction to be made between the words image and likeness, if you're wondering about that, that these two passages have both those words. They're parallel passages with the same point, and Gerhard points us to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where we read, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, using both words. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, etc., Gerhard notes that the word likeness is omitted in verse 27, saying, Hence, we gather that what was indicated before by the two words, image and likeness, is now expressed by one word, image. All right, so guys, if we go along with the common idea that all human beings are made in the image of God, what's the consequence? What are we getting ourselves into if we don't pump the brake and think about it? Well, among other things, for starters, we would have to agree with President Biden that this person, this person right here, this trans person, possesses the image of God, is an image of God. The first trans woman to have a successful uterus transplant, ovaries and eggs included, and I want to be the first trans woman to have an abortion. I will let a doctor who has successfully transplanted a uterine complex before, cut the organs out of a willing, healthy, transmasculine donor, place them in my body. I will devote myself, heart and soul, to their aftercare. I will have as much gay sex as it takes, with as many trans women as it takes, and let the transphobes and homophobes scratch their heads, wondering, what to make of it, and I want to be the first trans woman to have an abortion. Now, Paul said that on account of the sin that person desires to commit, the wrath of God is coming. We know that person is not the image of God. Now, the danger of playing a clip like that is that we then start to think that we're not as bad as that. And so maybe normal people are made in the image of God, but obviously not monstrous sinners like we just witnessed. They've lost it, of course. That, I mean, obviously everyone can see they've lost it, but maybe we still have it because we're not all that jacked up? No. No, you are all that jacked up in your own unique and various ways. We've all lost it, friends. Reverend A.L. Gravener, you hear me talk a lot about Theodore Gravener. Reverend A.L. Gravener is a far more apt theologian than I am, so let's hear it from him. He taught it this way in his Outlines of Doctrinal Theology from 1910. Before the conception of their first offspring, our first parents, Eve, tempted by Satan, and Adam voluntarily transgressed a commandment of God. And by this sin, they fell from their primeval state lost the image of God, became entirely depraved in spiritual death and obnoxious to temporal death 
and eternal damnation. Not the mention of the loss of the image of God, Reverend Grabner cites Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Now, the faithful teacher isn't finished, guys. No, not even by a long shot. He continues with what we rejoice to hear, a counter-argument to the casually assumed idea that all humans are made in the image of God. As he rightly teaches, that not only was the guilt of Adam imputed to his descendants, but his children and children's children have inherited from their first ancestor his corrupt nature, being flesh born of flesh, wholly depraved, totally blind of understanding in spiritual things, of perverse appetites, their will opposed to the will of God and only prone to evil, all their faculties enslaved in this service of sin without any ability in, in any measure to work their own spiritual restoration. This, dear saints, this is the historic Christian position. And many, many Bible verses are cited to show from where this teaching comes. Grabner cites Romans 5.12 again, and this time he includes verses 13 to 21, and he emphasizes verse 18, which says, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. And he also cites Genesis 4, 1 and 8, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and she bore Cain, the way, you know, every mother conceives children to this day, and said, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And then comes verse 8. And now, can you hear? <laughs> can you hear all you tacky people out there? President Biden trying to buffalo the American people on the proclamation of National Murderer's Day of Visibility. Would we believe it if he, if he said that murderers are made in the image of God? Verse 8. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, on this point, let me, let me pause here for a second. This isn't going to be something that Pastor Grabner points out, but let me draw your attention to what Jesus teaches in John 8. He says that the devil was from the beginning a murderer, doesn't he? One who murders is therefore in the likeness of Satan. Not God, Satan. And this is connected to lying, as Jesus teaches it in John 8 rather than standing in the truth. Sinners are made in the image of sinners after the father of lies and murder, the father of sin, the devil. Whose image do we bear without Christ? All right, back to Reverend Gravener. He cites Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In Genesis 8, 21, the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. And so many more, guys, like John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 7, 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. On our own, relying solely on how you and I were born into this world, we are as far from the image of God as East is from West. I mean, it doesn't get any farther from it. We fell from the image of God. We need Jesus so that the Holy Spirit will create in us a clean heart. As, as we are born from above and renewed in the image of God. This is why we need God to condescend, to come down to where we have fallen, to be incarnate, and to then raise us up in the resurrection. You see? We need to receive, as we heard in, in Ephesians and in Colossians, 
a new self that's made in the image of God. This is what being Christian is all about. This very language of every human being made in the image of God is a very, it is an attack against Christ. It is a dismissal against Christ and the need for Christ. The Roman Catholic document, this, this dignitas infinita, you get all the way down to the bare bones of it, pull away all the, the word salad, carve off all the extra flowery fluff, and what you get to is this declaration that man is precious without God, without Christ. That you are something good in and of yourself, which is contrary to Scripture. I am wretched. You are wretched. We are not good in and of ourselves. As all those Bible verses we just read tell us, we are evil. You take Christ out of the picture and we have no dignity. We have no goodness about us, no righteousness, no holiness, no image of God. How about Luke eleven thirteen? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Does Jesus say we're all made in the image of God there? I mean, is that what he's saying? I mean, remember, God is righteous and holy. Is, is he saying that mankind knows how to give, give good gifts because we're righteous and holy? No, he says that we know how to give good gifts even though we're evil. It shows that the image of God is not reason and intellect. It's not our cognitive ability. The image of God is righteousness and holiness. From that we have fallen. That is what we have lost. Our Lord, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, tells us this, which reminds me, you should support this show by ordering an Alexamenos Graffito t-shirt. Yes. We are unashamed of the gospel even when those who have not been made in the image of God ridicule us by mocking our God by portraying Jesus as a horse. What of it? You can't hurt us. We will gladly wear the t-shirt millennia later. Link to that shirt is in the description below. Okay, so yes, this nails it, doesn't it? Gravener takes us to Job 14.4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? There is not one. Not one human. Not one creature who can do that. It takes God. You can't give birth as a fallen lost image of God bearer, right? Eve not having the image of God, you cannot then give birth to something that does have the image of God. If you are an unclean creature, you will give birth to an unclean creature from flesh born of flesh. It's all right there, pretty clear, pretty simple. If we don't let the academics and the scholastics and all these guys muddy it up with all of their different turns of phrases and words and all the different, I mean, the, the, the document, the, the Dignitas Infinita is so long and convoluted. And this is the error of the academics. Just get to the text, guy. And the text is pretty clear. The Bible is clear, friends, that human beings are anything but made in the image of God. We are, without Christ, made in the image of our sinful parents who were made in the image of their sinful parents who were made in the image of theirs all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve, who sinned and in doing so lost the image of God. Well, wait a second, Pastor Bramwell, you say, knowing your Bibles well, as I know you all do, what about Genesis 9, 6? Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Well, I say to you, my friend, that makes a great argument against the Roman Catholic document that just came out, Dignitas Infinita, which argues against capital punishment, argue, argues against death penalty. There it is. But I know that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about the language of made in his own image. And now as you heard it read out loud, I think you're already coming around to see the conclusion to your own question, the answer to your own question. You're already seeing that the text is referring to our original state, that mankind was made originally in God's image. And now God still holds mankind to be precious, no doubt. 
Because when he made us, during the days of creation, he did in fact make us in his image. And that is valuable to him. That is precious to him. For this reason, he has not abandoned us, indeed. And for this reason, Genesis 3.15 declares the first gospel message right away after the fall. He has put in place the promise that he will redeem us and restore us to his image. For this reason, he does not permit us to treat humanity with disdain. But no, we have dignity for all of our brothers. We are the creation he chose to imbibe with his image, to breathe his spirit into. And that means something to him. Mankind, in our fallen state, without Christ, doesn't retain the image of God, but is still the noble creature that once bore the image of the Creator, who was once righteous and holy like God. And this is exactly how we are to understand Genesis 9-6. And if you were going to go there, James 3-9, which is the other text that sometimes gives us pause. With it, we bless our Lord with the tongue, our tongue, right, with our mouth. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. If this text is referring to humanity at large, if we want to grant that, apart from Christ, then it's rightly taken just like I just explained with Genesis 9-6. But what is the context of this passage? See, I would argue that it's not about humanity at large. James is addressing Christians through and through in this passage. It's addressed to Christians, and then chapter 3 here is specifically addressed to those who would desire to be pastor types. James 3.1, right? Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And then he goes all into the evils of the untamed tongue until we get here to verse 9, where he says, with that untamed tongue, we bless our Father, the Lord, and with that untamed tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. We understand those people to be whom? Yes, Christians, the church. And so now your minds are racing to St. John's admonition, aren't they? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 1 John 4, 19-21, also to Christians. All right, so now with all of that said, let's throw in a little bit of Francis Pieper into the mix, shall we? Just for good measure. Christian Dogmatics, Volume 1, gives us this. The Lutheran theologians are agreed that the image of God, which consists in the knowledge of God and holiness of the will, is lacking in man after the fall. Since Colossians 3.10 and Ephesians 4.24 distinctly state that it is being restored in the believer. Reverend Pieper, he quotes Reverend Luther and then hangs us firmly on the Christological truth that we need always stick to. While it's true that man has lost the image of God through sin, yet it remains true that it can be again acquired through the word of the Holy Ghost. That was Luther's quote. Pieper continues, This inspiration presents a thought which is found throughout Scripture from Genesis 3.15 on. From the moment we get the gospel, all the way through the texts, all of Scripture, the only reason why God still concerns himself with fallen mankind, pay attention to this, friends, this is spot on, the only reason why God still concerns himself with fallen mankind and preserves it 
and for its sake also the world, is that, according to Scripture, he desires to renew fallen mankind to the image in which he originally created it. Colossians 3.10 and Ephesians 4.24. This viewpoint is of great practical importance, Pieper says. The truth that God gave his son to the world and would renew the world in Christ to the original image of God, it will shield us against the misanthropy which the deceitfulness and malice of men in the spiritual domain, as we heard from the Pope, and in secular affairs, as we heard from President Biden, would create in us. To call man the image of God because he possesses reason and will and leave out of consideration what he is to become in Christ is to stretch a point. Reason and will of fallen mankind is, he says, <laughs> an idling motor. I love that picture. It's just a motor running. It's not going anywhere. It's just an idling motor. Fallen man's reason does not recognize salvation, but operates entirely in spiritual darkness. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Neither can he know them, is what we read there. We can't know God. And his will, Peter says, does not cling to God, but is enmity toward God. Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. And so, friends, we've answered what this means for us as it relates to our allies, like abolitionists rising, haven't we? They fight for the unborn because they believe all men are made in the image of God. It's a noble endeavor, to be sure, even if it's theologically wrong. We fight alongside them precisely because we know the opposite is true, that no man is made in the image of God, but is that which is born of flesh and is flesh, and without the renewal of Christ, knows only evil in his heart, even in his youth, even in his infancy, even in his in utero state. We now march with them because we see clearly from Scripture that their view is one one stop shy of the totality they wish to declare. They aren't for incremental bills that would leave some people in harm's way. Amen. It's not enough to save our unborn neighbors who can feel pain. Amen. Or who have a heartbeat. Amen. Because that leaves some neighbors exposed to the murderer. Amen. So does saying all men are born in the image of God. Amen. It leaves them exposed to the father of all murderers. It leaves them exposed to Satan. We fight against abortion not to see babies born into this world. No. That's not our end-all, be-all goal. No, we fight against abortion to see babies born into this world and see babies born into the world to come. Through the waters of holy baptism, born into Christ, restored by Christ to the righteousness and holiness of God, his image. God's will is that none perish, but all reach repentance in Christ Jesus. Not just that all are able to live, that all are treated with dignity in this human life, this temporal earthly life, but that all would live forever with him, having the image of God restored on them, in them. Consistently, it is equally why we march against the Democrats who would also put the image of God on mankind without Christ. I think they do it more intentionally and maliciously, whereas our allies are doing it from theological error. They would, they would have us say that all mankind is 
meaning the progressives, the Democrats, they would have us say all mankind is made in the image of God so that we can avoid Christ. That's not the intent of abolitionist rising, I know that. That's not the intent of Reverend Harris, and I know that. I would say that's not even the intent of most Roman Catholics, but it might be the intent of the Antichrist. <laughs> Indeed it is. To go along with the position that the Democrats have, that the secular left has, it is to leave our trans neighbors. If we are to say, yeah, even our trans neighbors are made in the image of God, and so we treat them with dignity and love, which we do treat them with dignity and love, but not because they're made in the image of God. To go along with that is to go along with an eternally damning misconception that the unrepentant sinner is okay in his sin, that his sin doesn't grieve God, which we know is not true. It does grieve God. What does Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 tell us? So that the wrath of God is coming because of sin. We want them to repent of that and re have the, the image of God restored to them and avoid the wrath of God. See, it says the opposite of what the left is trying to say. Every single person needs Jesus. That's what all of this is about. Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. Otherwise, he or she remains made in the image of his sinful parents. It's the truth. And speaking of truth, my friends, we're going to refer to the Apology of the Augsburg Confession in just a second for more on this topic, so don't go away. But first, truth at all costs is supported by an audience of Christians, each one made in the image of God just like you. This show and all my online teaching is possible with your help, guys. So if you would be so kind, please like this episode, subscribe or follow, depending on what platform, platform you're using to tune into it. And if you are on YouTube, well then click that little notification bell, it looks like a church bell down there, so you know when I post new videos. If you'd like to join the YouTube channel to get access to perks, like a little specialty badge that starts off as a little black cross next to your name and then turns into Luther's seal the longer you've been a member, or to get early access to each episode or, or access to live streams where we review the show's content and, and we keep our fingers as a, as a community, to use that internet term that kind of is cringeworthy, uh, to keep our fingers on the pulse of the culture together so we can bring God's word to bear on the cultural issues that assail the church. Well, that's the kind of stuff you get when you join the YouTube channel. I'll leave a link to learn more about that in the description. You can also support my work by shopping at our merch store, as I already mentioned with the Alex Amanos Graffito shirt. There's also other designs as well. Or by using Butterfat Books to order your next book, whatever it is, instead of ordering from Amazon. Use bookshop.org and then select Butterfat Books as the local bookstore you want to support. And it's just as if you purchased your book, whatever you're ordering, from Mrs. Bramwell down at 361 Main Street here in Ferndale. Or there's another option. You could go to TyrellBramwell.com and make a donation, like one of you wonderful people did recently. Thank you for your contributions and for helping us improve the quality and the reach of this show and all my online teaching that the truth of the gospel may go forth. Guys like Ryan can be spared from going down the rabbit hole of the stone choir and other errors. All right. So before we get back to our conversation on the image of God and we hear from our Lutheran forefathers, Let's address the comment I told you we would get back to at the beginning of the show. Adam Wright's tweet about how I speak worse of stone choir than of sodomites. Now, let's just say, for the sake of argument, he's right. Now, I'm not sure he is. I might be able to argue that he's not. But let's grant it to him, for the sake of argument, that my words are harsher toward the stone choir than they are toward the LGBTQ. So why do you think that is, Adam? I mean, there's a simple an obvious reason why a pastor might speak more sternly against a group who come in the name of Jesus and lead people away from true Christianity than that same pastor would, say, speak against a group of people who are obviously outside of the truth. Even when that other group, the LGBTQ, bear the name of Christ. They're very obviously not Christian. Which one do you think is the bigger threat to Christ's sheep? A wolf dressed like a wolf? Or let's say a, dressed like a drag queen? <laughs> or a wolf dressed as a sheep, as a lamb of God? 
gathering followers who can't see his true colors, gathering them from Christ's flock. Which one? I mean, if you're really going to try to use your brain in that brain bucket of yours, I mean, even if it doesn't have any biblical brilliance like others may possess, notice I'm not even going to cite scripture here because this is easily addressed with the commonest of common senses. Which one do you think would necessitate, require harsher language? The obvious danger? The drag queen danger? The wolf that you can see is a wolf danger? Or the insidious danger? Let me help you with a couple metaphors. Oh, sorry, big word. Wait, uh, let me help you with a couple comparisons, or at least let's just do one. I know it's going to be hard. With a comparison. If there is an army to your left shooting their guns, just wildly shooting their guns every which way, which could be harmful to you if you walked in front of them, what I need to tell you to stop going over there, what I need to tell you to take cover, with a, what I need to use a, a stern exclamation, harsh language, I mean, maybe you, maybe I would need to tell you that, but I'm guessing not normally, not the normal person. But if a mass shooter to your right comes into a church and, and I see that that mass shooter has a gun under his coat just as he begins to pull it out, what kind of language might you, and, I, and by you I mean the rational person, what kind of language might you expect to hear from me? a pastor who cares for his church? Would you expect loud, direct, commanding words, clear, sharp, powerful words of warning? Yeah, probably. Do you see the comparison? The stone choir, that's the mass shooter. While the LGBTQ, which I do speak harshly against, is a known army with guns blazing. Okay, so I can't help myself. <laughs> Let's, let's use some scripture verses. At least one. Let's keep it simple. I keep wanting to give you more than you can handle. One. Stone choir. This is a, this is a Proverbs 12, 6 situation, if ever there was one. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright delivers them. There you go, bud. I hope you understand, Adam Wright. If you don't, well, then I sincerely hope that the Lord would have mercy on your soul. Truly, may he forgive you for your sinful words, for you know not what you do. So cool. All right. With that out of the way, how is our Christian confession regarding who is made in the image of God laid out by the Lutheran reformers in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession? What do we have at our disposal. What is our faithful Lutheran confession? This is what we confess in Article 2 of the Apology, which is on original sin. In our definition of original sin, we mentioned concupiscence and also denied to the natural powers of the human creature fear of and trust in God. We wanted to show that original sin also included these maladies. Ignorance of God, contempt of God, the absence of the fear of and trust in God, and the inability to love God. These are the chief defects of human nature, in conflict especially with the first table of the Decalogue. That's the first three commandments. We have said nothing new here. The traditional definition, rightly understood, says precisely the same thing when it states, original sin is is the absence of original righteousness. But what is righteousness? Here, the scholastics quibble over philosophical questions and do not explain what original righteousness is. Furthermore, in the scriptures, this righteousness includes not only the second table of the Decalogue, commandments four through seven, but also the first, one through three which requires fear of God, faith, and love of God. 
Some who come across this show, you guys, may not know what the first three commandments deal with, that they deal with the relationship between God and man, the vertical relationship, and that the last seven deal with our relationship, our relationship between each other, between man and man, our horizontal relationships, right? So this is the breakdown that we're hearing here in our confessions. So we continue with the apology. Thus, original righteousness was intended to include not only a balanced physical constitution, but these gifts as well. A more certain knowledge of God, fear of God, and confidence in God, or at least the uprightness and power needed to do these things. And Scripture affirms this when it says, Genesis 1.27, that humankind, mankind, was formed in the image and likeness of God. What else does this mean except that a wisdom and righteousness that would grasp God and reflect God was implanted in humankind? That is, humankind received gifts like the knowledge of God, fear of God, trust in God, and the like. This is how Irenaeus interpreted the likeness of God. After having discussed many other things related to this topic, Ambrose then says, That soul is not in the image of God, in which God is not always present. And in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.10, Paul shows that the image of God is the knowledge of God, righteousness, and truth. Even Peter Lombard is not afraid to say that original righteousness is the very likeness of God, which was implanted in the human creature by God. The statements of the ancients that we cited do not contradict Augustine's interpretation concerning the image of God. Thus, when the traditional definition says that sin is the absence of righteousness, it excludes not only the obedience of the lower human powers, but also the knowledge of God, trust in God, fear and love of God, or certainly the power needed to produce those things. So if you're watching the podcast and you, and you need to pause and reread these texts, this text on the screen, any part of this, by all means, guys, do it. It's one of the benefits of using you know, the internet to do this kind of stuff. Pause it, take a look at it. The Christians of previous generations were far smarter than we are and far more articulate than our barbaric culture generally allows us to be. What did our Lutheran fathers say? The original righteousness that man had after the likeness of God was not only a matter of, of what do they say, physical constitution, that is health, physical well-being, never dying, that kind of a thing. It was also the knowledge of God. It was also the fear of God and the confidence in God. Even, they say, the power to do these things. That's why we confess that, that we, are, we are brought to this faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by ourselves, having no ability within ourselves to do this. Take a look at the third article of the creed. We don't even possess the power to believe in God. To do so, to believe in him, possessing the very power to believe in God is to be made in his image. To have the Holy Spirit crafting you, forming you, working you into the image of God. And that comes from the Holy Spirit in our rebirth, our regeneration. When we're regenerated through the cleansing of our conscience, with given a new heart, new mind that isn't transformed after, after, or isn't conformed after the world, I should say, but transformed after Christ, right? This is, this is what the Bible teaches. Now also, in our confessions in the formula of Concord, the solid declaration, Article 1, which is also on original sin, we see a repeat throughout all these articles, all these, all these documents. We read that original sin is a complete absence of lack of the original righteousness acquired in paradise. 
or of, or of the image of God, according to which the human being was originally created in truth, holiness, and righteousness. So, <laughs> back to our, our original question and our short answer, right? No, no. Man is not made in the image of God. Humans today, meaning mankind was, yes. Are we still? No. Are you? No. Were you? No. Only in baptism are you restored to the image of God in Christ by wearing the robe of righteousness. Not on this side of the fall into sin, as long as we live without Christ, on that side of, of, of faith, do we have the image of God. We need Jesus for that. To say all mankind has the image of God is to make Christ obsolete. It is to remove his incarnate work, what he came into the flesh to do. It is to remove the need to hear the word. It is to remove the need for the sacraments. It is to re remove the, the, the need for baptism. Christ is our Redeemer. He redeems us from our fallenness by making us into the image of God in Him. As you already know. So we didn't need this episode, did we? No, none of us needed this episode. It's understood that when we're baptized, we are changed. It's taught that we're made new creatures. Well, what's in that newness? The righteousness and holiness of God. In baptism, you were made anew in the image of God, just as we hope the unborn baby will be once he's delivered into this world. This is why we fight against abortion. And just as we hope the trans guy in that clip we watched today who wants to sinfully do all kinds of horrible, horrible things, who desires to be a woman just so he can murder a human child in, in a womb, just as we hope he can be restored to the image of God. Yes, we pray on both accounts that they would be made in the image of God. And yes, this is why we have Lutheran schools, but because we hope that all those who will attend will, will learn of Jesus, even if they're no longer just for our, our own parish children, which is, I would say, the better model. But even if they are now mission fields, the hope is that all of our neighbors would eventually, too, come to know Jesus, be born in the likeness of God, made in his image through the waters of holy baptism. It's the solution we're fighting for on all battlefields. It is the remedy to what ails our culture, understanding truly what is the image of God and how we get it the renewal of souls in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, let's give the last word for today to Gerhard, Johann Gerhard. He says, In order that no doubt may be left on this point, we must compare the first man as he was made before the fall and as he is described after the fall. Moreover, we ought to examine how the descendants of Adam are described. Out of such a comparison, it's clearly seen that man from being righteous and holy became impious and unrighteous. From rich, utterly poor. From healthy, sick. From living, dead. From free, a slave. From son of God, an enemy of God. From heir of eternal life, guilty of condemnation. Having lost the most beautiful image of God, man put on the dark specter of the devil. Hence the apostle clearly states that we bear no longer the image of God and of the heavenly Adam, but the image of the earthly Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. So my bad. I guess we're going to give St. Paul the last word. I kind of like that better. So, uh, maybe even the Holy Spirit who inspired St. Paul. I like that even more, better. What do we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 49? Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust. Hmm, look at that right there, friends. We shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Yes, indeed. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to this show. I'm taking a vacation next week. 
I'll be out of the office and out of the studio. So I'm sorry to say there won't be a new episode of Truth at All Costs next Saturday, but we will be back, never fear, with a new episode of Truth at All Costs on April 27th. So uh, make sure you come back for that. I appreciate your understanding. If you like the episode, please share it with a friend and consider giving it a five-star rating and or a positive review or posting a positive comment on YouTube. Do all the things that help the algorithm push it out to more people. Whatever you can do to help our neighbors find the show and to find truth that is spoken at all costs. Thanks, guys. While you seek peace, if possible, yes, remember to speak the truth at all costs. I hope this episode of Truth at All Costs was a blessing to you and yours, whomever you may want to share it with. Take a look at the playlist if you want to find more good content just like this to help you in your walk in the faith. And if you want to watch a sermon, I post my sermons on this YouTube channel as well. If you didn't know that, here's last week's right here. Christ be with you, and we'll talk to you in the next video.